took a little figuring out to sing, but that was a good song. I love that song. Well, once again, it's wonderful to see everybody here, and, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to know there's only about a month of summer left. So, no, it's not the 4th of July. We all know that uh, patriots are people who passionately love their country. There's no question about that. And we're willing to support and defend it with their very lives. The word patriot awakens memories of great heroes in our minds of, from back in American history. We look to Washington and Jefferson, the rest of the Continental Congress, the great rallying cries like, give me liberty or give me death from Patrick Henry, or I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country by Nathan Hale. That's the first time that's done that in a long time. You'd probably not be surprised if I said that today's Webster Dictionary actually says one who loves and supports his country as the definition for patriot. But the word ultimately derives from a Greek word, patrios. Right? No, I'm not turning into Brother Doug, but I think it's important to show what this meaning actually is, and that meaning is of one's father. So what... Oh, this thing... Patriotic devotion can be seen in the lives of the first century Christians in their spiritual warfare. Peter and John were beaten for preaching Jesus, but never shied away from their responsibilities to preach. Paul was persecuted at every turn, yet never ceased to proclaim the gospel. Stephen was stoned, and James was beheaded for their uncompromising loyalty to Christ. In today's Christian, must have the mentality of the first century Christians. They must be spiritual patriots, just as Paul was a patriot of the Father, and James, and Stephen. Christians are, are the actual soldiers of Christ on active duty. We're not the reserves. We're the frontline troops. It is a spiritual warfare that is being waged around us today. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to God and the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ and His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay? The citizens of heaven, much like the Jewish Christians Peter was writing to, we long for our heavenly homeland, and <clears throat> we readily acknowledge our status as pilgrims and sojourners in this present world. We're here for a purpose, okay? If, if we did not have a purpose on earth, we'd raise up from baptism and be directly taken off to paradise. God leaves us here for a reason, and that reason is to be his frontline troops on earth to maintain the kingdom on earth. One day in the future, Jesus is going to return to withdraw his troops from this temporary tour of duty called corporal life. Until that time, the church serves as the Lord's outpost here on earth. That colony in heaven which we contend for cannot be defined geographically, but it is no less real. Okay? We don't know the confines of heaven. I think they're probably eternal like God is eternal. But the Lord reigns in the hearts of men and women who have been redeemed by His Son. He reigns here in our hearts. He reigns here in our church. He lives among us through our service. As God's patriots were faithful saints who deeply loved the church and have pledged to defend it. 
much like our military takes an oath to defend the Constitution. So we defend our church just like our soldiers and sailors defend our nation. <coughs> Only our battleground has much more lasting effects all the way into eternity. At conversion, Christians declare their liberty from Satan and their loyalty to God. Christians should in, uh, engage in spiritual warfare and are in, in for the fight of their lives, and only the committed will survive the onslaughts of the enemy because he's waiting there constantly to trap you if he can. If you lose the faith, he will take advantage of that and lead you farther and farther astray. The inspired Word of God gives us our marching orders. The book of Jude, in particular, is God's field manual for spiritual warfare and is called to arms. And Jude reminds us that our adversary is real and determined. It tells us how to respond to the world's hostility and aggression towards us because of our belief. As a soldier of Christ, there is no room for pacifism for eternity is at stake. And it's not just your eternity that's at stake, it's your children's as well, and your neighbor's. Make, so make no mistake about it, we are in a life and death struggle for the souls of men. Paul gave this final instruction to Timothy, and, and we should consider it as being given to us as well. It says, fight the good fight of faith. If, if you look at... 1 Timothy 6.11 says, But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Be loving. Be kind. Fight with love. We have to be prepared for that fight. 1 Timothy 1.18 gives us this charge. I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. So, that's not just for Timothy's sake, that's for our sake as well. We have to be ready to wage the good warfare. We need to stand together as Christians and form Christ's crusaders by each of us banding together as brothers and sisters and helping each other to be good soldiers. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Share. We should not go through any heartache alone. We have our family around us. It is just for us to share with our family so that they may help us along the road. Jude was not one of the twelve. He was a half-brother of Jesus. While the book of Jude is the shortest one in the New Testament, it is the most concise in dealing with the need for Christians to <clears throat> with the need for Christians to remain on guard against those that would lead us astray and away from the true church. Jude starts with a very endearing greeting which serves an example excellent example of how we should think about and treat each other as fellow soldiers. Jude says, A servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called, beloved in, in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. That multiplication comes by our togetherness and fellowship. Okay? From sharing things together, sharing our troubles, sharing our joys, praying for each other. Jude's writing quickly takes on a different tone as it begins to point out that we must wage spiritual, war, spiritual warfare and post spiritual centuries. The book of Jude was intended to serve a twofold purpose a heavenly call to arms and a strategy for spiritual victory. The, church, the church's success depended on their taking heed to the wake-up call, the warning that false teachers had infiltrated their ranks and, po and posed, posed a serious threat to the well-being well -being of the church. Okay? So, 
it wasn't completely successful, was it? It didn't go out to everybody. And guess what we have today? Denominations. We have churches that are so far from the true word, it's unreal. Okay? We have all kinds of things going on that are not scriptural because we were not able to fend that off when the first attacks came, although they did pretty good in the really early church, they weren't prepared when the Romans began to take over the church and redesign a church that would fit their needs of their government. So when trouble arises, it is not enough to sit idly by and wish things were different. And like any deadly disease, the problem cannot be corrected by ignoring it. You cannot ignore what's going on and just hope it'll go away because it won't. With many illnesses, there is a brief but precious window of opportunity to treat the problem and stop its progress. It was time for the early church to rally the troops. It's time for us to do the same today. In the early church, if the early church would have rallied the truth, it was not too late to stem the tide of the injurious effects of the false teachers, but it, they weren't. They didn't rally fast enough, did it? In addition to alerting them of the present danger, this book serves as a field manual for battling the false teachers. The manual is concise, proven, and practical. The same manual is of great importance for us today. <coughs> I highly encourage you to study the book of Jude very closely. The, the recipients of this letter are still in the church today, and we are called. 1 Peter 2 9, you remember he was Peter was writing to the uh, Jews who had been driven out of Jerusalem, the converts who had been driven out of Jerusalem. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that you is you too. Not just those Jews, but each and every one of us. Okay? There's, we're still here, we're still in the church, and we still have standards we have to meet in the church, and we still have opposition to Christ's word. Okay? 2 Thessalonians 2.14 tells us, To this he called you through, the, through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's each and every one of you. Okay? We are beloved and sanctified by Christ. If you are, are the beloved of God, you are sanctified. There's no doubt about it. Each and every one of us that have made... <clears throat> made the commitment, are sanctified, that means, you know what? You should be armed. You should, you should carry everything you need to combat the false teachers are, are just the little things that are put in your way, little stumbling blocks that are put in your way, and even the big ones. You should be prepared for that. You should be prepared to battle against evil, battle against Satan. We are kept or preserved by God and we are valuable to Christ and there is safety in Him. We are a precious commodity to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves us each and every one and He wants us to prosper and He wants His church to prosper on earth so that as many souls as possible can be saved before He returns. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is <coughs> he it is that bears much fruit. Far apart from me, you can do nothing. Far apart from me, excuse me. So we can either accept Christ on his terms, or we can be thrown out of his inheritance. John 15, 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Jude was looking for someone to stand in the gap. 
And we need to be standing in the gap today. Ezekiel 22.30 tells us, And I sought for a man among them who, who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I found none to stand in the breach. Are you willing to carry the standard for Jesus Christ? It's a hard job sometimes, but it's a very rewarding job. Even if your children are grown, do you keep pressing for their return to the church? If you've never committed to Jesus, are you teaching your children not to commit? Are you yourself becoming an instrument in their fall from grace because of your lack of commitment to Christ? We must wage spiritual warfare with a patriotic plea. Verse 3, Jude says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, Jude wanted to just write them a letter saying, how great it was to be saved, to be, have fellowship with them, <coughs> and rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. Right? But he couldn't, because this other item was more, more <coughs> pressing. There were false teachers coming in and trying to subvert the Christian word. We know about the problems they had with, with uh, Jews coming up from... <coughs> Jerusalem and saying that they all had to be uh, circumcised in order, order to worship, and but they were they were even going beyond that, you know, trying to get them to celebrate Jewish holidays and all kinds of th- that Christ never called for. They were going beyond the book. In the heat of the battle, the best laid plans sometimes have to change. So Jew didn't get to go on with that letter of love and fellowship. He had to change it to a battle plan at you know at the last moment. That's the only way sometimes to fortify the faith of our brothers and sisters. Judah intended to write about their common salvation. His strategy was praiseworthy, but circumstances forced this alteration right at the last minute. Jude had learned that his friends were under attack by false teachers. So Jude laid aside his plan and wrote about something that was more needful. There are times when we must put something good on the back burner to address something more pressing. They needed to defend the gospel then, and we need to defend it now. Jude encouraged them to contend earnestly for the faith. The elders and I want to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith. Contend means to fight or struggle. That does not mean hit them on the head with a bat and drag them in. That never works. It means show them the true way. Show them how great it is to be a Christian. Smile when you walk down the street. Smile when you go to the bank. Rejoice. Sing. You know, if you're walking along singing a a good a good tune out of the songbook and stuff, they're going to want to know why you're so happy. And they're going to start, maybe that'll, that song will trigger a memory in their past and they'll return to God. You never know. But we should be rejoicing all the time about how good we have it because of Christ our Savior. We don't need to be sitting around glum. We need to be happy. Happy, happy, happy. Show them the true way. Jude felt that the situation required strong action to stop the lies of the false prophets and the spies that were among them. Okay? (coughs) They needed to be content, or they needed to contend and implied that there was opposition to the truth, and there was. We have that opposition, opposition to truth today as well in the form of denominations. They are not operating by the truth. We have that opposition to truth today in the form of denominations, in the form of government redefining marriage. 
in the form of pandering to LGBTQ agendas that are turning the entire country into a modern Sodom and Gomorrah. The church has even more enemies today, and when the ad adversaries grow bold enough to launch an offens offensive, Christians must be prepared to respond. Biblical principles hold true in the church today. We cannot conduct business as usual when members are under attack and eternity hangs in the balance. Immediate action is required when someone is trying to draw our children away from the church by convincing them the differences just don't matter. A sinner's prayer will save you. No, it won't. They're trying to convince us that our children that you don't have to be immersed. You can run through a sprinkler and be saved. No, you can't. All you must do is put your hand on the TV and send a check. Right? You remember, remember those sermons coming on the TV? You know why they stop? Because of those. Those TV sermons, people... People would, would, would listen to that preacher on there and he'd say, now reach out and touch your TV screen. Feel the Spirit go into you. And send me your check. Well, TV tubes gave off static electricity and people were fooled because they felt something when they touched the TV preacher's screen. They're there lying to you at every turn. They're there with false False idea. The lies are everywhere. Jude began his counteroffensive by writing a letter. He was writing a letter exhorting them to stay closer to the, to the Scriptures. Writing was an important ministry in the first century. That's, that's how the Bible was created. It was from the writings of the apostles and, and other disciples like Jude. Remember Jude being a half-brother of Jesus didn't believe in Jesus when Jesus was on earth. He didn't believe in Him until He was resurrected. So writing was an important ministry. We use it today. It continues to be vital today. Sister Anna Mae makes sure everybody has cards on their birthdays and anniversaries or if they get sick. Showing their fellowship and love for one another. Okay? We have written reminders. We, ha we have short messages in our bulletin. Okay? The written word is still very important. Christians are under orders to encourage one another. Hebrews 3.13 But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Jude was trying to inspire his fellow Christians, and the Hebrew writer was making the same point in Hebrews 10.24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. <coughs> Paul echoes Jude's plea to be prepared in 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Okay? The focus of Jude's exhortation was to alert his readers to the dangers before them. The one, if, if you look in Jude 3, it talks about faith delivered. The once delivered faith is an objective body of teaching of which Jesus is the subject and the source. Okay? This is Jesus' ethical teaching and religious instruction. This is the system of faith revealed in the New Testament. Just as Jude wanted the early church to stand up for the faith, we need to be standing up for it and defending the faith today. James placed strong emphasis on the faith being once for all delivered. The phrase reveals that there will not be any modern day revelations. There are no prophets out there. Although some of these denominations actually call members of their circle prophets. 
We have it over and over. In the, in the Scriptures, there will be no prophets. Okay? The phrase reveals that there will not be any modern day prophet. All knowledge required to maintain Christ's church has already been given. It's all right here in the book. Okay? And all religious truth has already been revealed. All we have to do is read and study it. Jude told the early church to contend for the faith. The call to contend means we are to do likewise. We must contend, struggle for truth, resist compromise, and oppose false teaching. Thus, great effort was and is to be extended in standing for the truth. <clears throat> they were to put up a real fight against false teaching, and so are we. They were warned to stay on the narrow way by giving it their all, and we should give it our all today. God's patriots should be concerned about soundness in the faith. Paul was very clear in his letter to Titus. He said in Titus 1.13, This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. We must personally stand for the faith. 1 Corinthians 6.13 tells us, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and be prepared to defend it. Sometimes I think maybe it should have said, act like women, because... Sometimes where the church is concerned, it seems the women are stronger at getting the family to go to church than the men are. Men, we need to step up. I went back to it. You guys just hoped I was skipping one. Jude clearly emphasizes that doctrine does matter. Paul shows his concern by warning against false teachers at Ephesus in 1 Timothy 1.3. As I urged you when I was going... To Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. In other words, even though Timothy was his companion and vital to his uh, journeys, he left him behind at Ephesus to watch out for these false teachers that were trying to come into the church. So the general left the colonel behind, right? Paul again warns us in Romans, Romans 16, 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary, contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. They were earnestly to contend for the faith. In other words, do so with all their might. Once again, I say, we must do likewise as we are reminded in Titus 2.15. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Okay, That's, That is, disregard you when you are preaching. Disregard you when you are sharing the Word of God disregard you when you're sharing love. When you're in a bad mood and don't want to talk to anybody and you're just being nasty, you deserve to be disregarded. So, we're talking about disregarding the Word of God. Disregarding the spreading of the Word of God. Don't take no for an answer is what it's saying. A carefree attitude in the struggle against error is sure to end in defeat of the congregation. We need to keep, keep that in mind. We have a mighty trust to keep. Faith is like a baton being handed, handed from one generation of runners to the next in a relay race that we absolutely cannot afford to lose. Truth must be passed on from one generation to the next and it is our duty to protect and preserve that truth. The time is now for all spiritual patriots to wage spiritual warfare. We lose our next generation to false teachings of politicians that label themselves as progressive, 
when the progress they seek is self-interest and the rebuilding of Sodom and Gomorrah on a global scale. We lose them to the false teaching of the liberal media. We lose them to the profanity of musicians and filmmakers. Worst of all, we are losing them to dominations that are embracing liberal ideals. I think one of the hardest things for a parent to witness is when a child attends church every week and never takes the steps to be saved or gets married to someone from outside the church and is then pulled away to a non-scriptural denomination. I've lost most of my own children to just that thing, marrying outside the church. And it's heartbreaking. As parents and Christians, we must work hard to, the reserve, to preserve the church if it is to survive. So, will you be able to declare, like Paul, that you have done all that you can? We must be able to de declare that. In 2 Timothy 4 7, when Paul's saying his goodbyes, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Will you be able to do that when the time comes? Are you fighting the good fight? Are you fighting to protect the church and your family from Satan's grasp? If you were to die today, would you be able to echo Paul's words? If not, maybe you need your brothers and sisters to pray with you. Are you ready to take up arms against false teaching? Have you heard the inspired word of God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? If you would be proud to confess Jesus as your Savior, are you sorry for all the sin that's ruled your life up to now and you want to have God's forgiveness for that sin, right now is your day of salvation. And you may be baptized to have your sins forgiven and rise up a new life in Christ. Are you going to deny your salvation until it's too late for you? If not, come now as we stand and sing.